Every zoning meeting for March 21st, 2018 will now come to order. Please stand with us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. 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 Thank Chairman Williams? Here. Vice Chairman Shavir? Here. Secretary Chambers? Here. Member Faison? Here. Dr. Faison? Member Baker? Here. Member Ritchie? School Board Member Hare? Here. And we have quorum. Did you want to do it now? Yes. I'd like to invite our newest alternate member, Faison, down to the podium to swear him in. Okay. Place your hand, raise your right hand and hand on the Bible and repeat after me. I state your name. I, Aaron Faison. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support. That I will support. Protect and defend. Protect and defend. The Constitution. The Constitution. And government. And government. Of the United States. Of the United States. And the state of Florida. And the state of Florida. Against all enemies. Against all enemies. Domestic or foreign. Domestic or foreign. And that I will bear. And I will bear. True faith. True faith. Loyalty and allegiance. Loyalty and allegiance. To the same. To the same. And that I am entitled. And that I am entitled. To hold office. To hold office. Under the Constitution. Under the Constitution. That I will faithfully perform. That I will faithfully perform. All of the duties. All the duties. Of the office of. Of, of the office of. The Planning and Zoning Commission. The Planning and Zoning Commission. Of the City of Titusville. Of the City of Titusville. On which I am about to enter. Of which I am about to enter. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations and thank you very much for joining the Planning and Zoning Commission. You may now join your seat and uh, join the commission for the rest of the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Next is approval of minutes for February 21st, 2018. Uh, I move that we, Did you, uh, we can make motion. Yeah. accept the minutes on February 21st. Is there a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? <coughs> All persons who, who anticipate speaking on any public hearing item must first fill out the oath card to be heard on that agenda item and so sign the oath card contained thereon. These cards are located on the table near the entrance to the council chamber or, or may be obtained from the recording secretary. These items, the meeting will be conducted in, in accordance to procedures adopted in resolution 24-1997. Those speaking in favor of a request will be heard first. Those opposed will be heard second. And those who may, wish to make a public comment on the item will speak third. The applicant may make a brief rebuttal if necessary. A representative from either side for or against may cross-examine a witness. Anyone who speaks is considered a witness. If you have photographs, sketches, or documents you desire the commission to consider, they must be submitted into evidence and will be retained by the by the secretary. Staff, has all items been properly advertised? Yes, they have. Has anybody on the board had the opportunity to speak or visit the sites coming before us? Okay. With that, um, I had a request to move up item, is it D, item D, and I know that we had, um, so I wanted to see if the board is agreeable to moving up D behind A, or after after A. So he goes A, D, B, C. So move. Um, second. Second. All in favor, aye. Okay. Okay, starting with uh, item 9A then, conditional use permit number 1 2018. Uh, this starts on page 8 of your packet. Uh, the applicant is requesting a conditional use permit to establish an event center, which is considered a recreation and commercial amusement indoor per the land development regulations. Uh, the proposed facility will be located within an existing unit of the Sears Town Mall. The Sears Town Mall is located at 3550 South Washington Avenue within the Regional Commercial RC Zoning District. Uh, the proposed event center will be approximately 10,000 square feet in size with 8,000 square feet dedicated to assembly uses and 2,000 square feet uh, for storage. No expansion of the existing building is proposed as part of this request. Uh, the use will utilize the existing parking and ingress egress points for vehicular access to the property. Um, that's pretty much the basics of the request. Uh, I do reference in the staff report an explanation of kind of the activities that would go on within the building that was provided by the applicant. That information is on page 19 of your packet. Um, and the way the unit uh, is, what they're proposing is on page 21. And with that, I will uh, try and answer any questions you have. Okay, let's open it to the public. Um, do we have cards on this item? Lisa McCotter. Okay, Ms. McCotter, can you come up? Hi, my name is Lisa Potter. I am the general manager of the mall. It's now called Titusville Mall. It was recently purchased, so we will be changing the signage shortly. And I'm really just here to answer any questions you have. I think that was a great explanation of what we're 
planning on doing and in the packet it's uh, it looks good so does anybody have any questions for me I didn't I think the packet was pretty self-explanatory for, for myself That's a good um, job. so it, it seemed reasonable considering it's under that zoning and it's small and but that's my opinion. I'm just one vote. So. Okay. <laughs> Are there any questions? Vice Chairman Shabir. Uh, since this is going to be an event uh, center for weddings and conference meetings, uh, are you going to have kitchens and bar and uh, any type of facilities like that? There, there is a, a, a kitchen there. There's nothing except a sink. We are not planning on providing any ovens, anything like that. It would just be someone catering and bringing in, just plating out the food. Um, they could have set up our area for themselves, but we're not providing anything like that. Okay, so basically you're just running space. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay, I guess that is it. All right, thank you. Thank you. Oh, one more question. Okay. <laughs> uh, this event center, uh, I, I'm going to ask if, if nothing's in here about this, but you, is it a long-term lease? I mean, you're leasing for a year or two or five years, or what's the status oh, of that? No, it, it would be rented on an as-needed basis for, you know, each occasion. It would be run by us, uh, Titusville Mall. And, you know, people would just come in and rent it for an evening, for an event. Um, you know, if they wanted it for some event for a weekend, if it was more like a conference, and there are smaller rooms that they could rent, like a, with a, uh, like a boardroom type, birthday parties, things like that. Well, you answered my question. So the mall is, is, in fact, going to be in charge of this, Correct. this space. Correct. And you'll have control over that. Yes. Okay, yes. thank you. Okay. All right, so we'll close this to the public. Are there any questions of staff? Or women, before you do this, are there any more cards on this? No, sir. Okay, so we'll close this to the public. Are there any questions of staff? Okay. So is there a motion on this item? Mr. Chairman? Mr. Chairman, I make a motion to approve the conditional use permit number 1-201 Defense Center. Is there a second? Second. Okay, can we take a roll call on this? Member Baker? Yes. Vice Chairman Shabir? Yes. Member Faison? Yes. Secretary Chambers? Yes. Chairman Williams? Yes. Motion passes. So when does this go before City Council? It will be before City Council next week, the 21st. No, sorry, the 27th. Okay. There you go. Thank you. All right, so if we can move to item D. Uh, sorry, yes, item uh, 9D starts on page 77 of your packet. This is rezoning request number 1-2018 at 2300 Columbia Boulevard. Um, the applicant is requesting to rezone an approximately 3.69 acre property located at 2300 Columbia Boulevard. Uh, the request is to rezone the property from the Community Commercial Zoning District to the Regional Commercial Zoning District uh, within the Comprehensive Plan Future Land Use designation of Commercial High Intensity. The parcel is 3.69 acres, which meets the minimum lot size of two acres for the proposed RC zoning district. Uh, this rezoning, if approved, will allow the establishment of a lumber and building supplies sale use, which is permitted with limitations in the RC zoning district. Um, and with that, that's really all I wanted to go on about here. Basically, um, I did receive a couple calls on this uh, prior to this meeting. Um, mainly people were concerned about the differences between CC and RC zoning district. For the most part, the development standards are the same. The allowable uses are very similar in nature. Uh, one difference is that the regional commercial zoning district allows this type of a lumber and building supplies sales use to put that kind of in something that's a little more relatable is uh, the the Lowe's and the Home Depot that are in town they they are within the regional commercial zoning district um, and the the person that or the company that would like to occupy the property sells uh, fencing material so uh, which would be a similar type of type of use to um, what Lowe's and Home Depot the type of materials that they sell and that is uh, the reason for the request um, and with that I will try and answer any questions that you have. I'm trying to help them real quick. There you go. Yeah. Okay, uh, if, are there any questions? Just, well, let's just open up the public real quick and uh, do we have our donuts? Yes, Kim Rosanka. Rosanka. Okay. Okay. Uh, good evening, uh, Chairman Williams, members of the Planning and Zoning Commission. My name is Kim Rosanka. I'm an attorney with the law firm of Campbell and Goldman in Cocoa, Florida. I'm here representing Gen Lee Development. Um, this is a company whose principal is Larry Rhodes. He recently had um, heart surgery, so he will not be able to be here. But the uh, person who intends to occupy it, um, Bobby Jacobs, a secure fence, is here, so we can tell you a little bit more about what he intends to do with the project. Uh, Mr. Trevor, <laughs> I'm sorry, I struggled with his last name, um, covered a lot of what I had tended to say it's in your staff report. Uh, Mr. Rhodes purchased this property in 1998, annexed into the city, and this is the zoning that he was given. Um, he did it intentionally for an aluminum company. And since that time, he's had um, a Sunbelt Rentals and an FPNL contractor. So there has been outdoor storage, but it wasn't permitted by the zoning category, which is why we're doing the rezoning now to make it consistent with your zoning code. Um, it's going to be a, a, you know, a nice-looking place. Mr. Jacobs has already started cleaning it up. He's going to have custom fencing, custom displays, a nice iron uh, fence, and he can tell you more about that. Uh, the site plan um, doesn't change. It was approved back in 1989 or 90. It's got a 9,600 square foot building that Mr. Jacobs intends to use. We just a little bit about their storage area that will be fenced off from the public as required by the zoning code. This um, request is to allow the fence company to come in and to make it consistent with your zoning code what he wants to do. As staff report states, this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan designation of commercial high intensity, consistent with existing zoning, zoning in the area, the access is on a major arterial road. This will not create a nuisance in the opinion of staff, in our opinion as well, and it will. Um, and it does have proper buffering and will maintain the proper fencing that it does have now. 
the staff has recommended approval, which we um, thank you, and we request that you approve this rezoning to RC. Here are the questions. <coughs> Thank okay, you. thank you. That was the only card. Or two more. Bobby Jacobs. Thank you. Uh, my name is Bobby Jacobs, owner of Secure Fence Rail. My wife and I own the company. Um, her and I are both from Florida, born and raised. I grew up in Seminole County. My wife grew up over in uh, Blue, uh, Lakeland. Uh, we moved over here originally. Can you, can you speak a little oh, closer? Yeah, sorry. Um, my wife and I moved over here uh, about five, six years ago. I worked for a couple of fence companies. Seeing this area was definitely in need of some improvements, and that's what my wife and I have done. Um, if anybody's been by either one of our locations, one in Melbourne, uh, just north of Post Road, which we just pulled that location, uh, we do an elaborate display, uh, landscaping, uh, showroom, um, a Titus office, the same, uh, real nice displays um, with, with different um, lighting, landscaping, fence designs and stuff, and really try to go all out uh, to give the customers uh, the want to come and look and, and walk around, touch and feel. Um, that's been a big issue that I've ran into here in this area is a lot of the fence companies in, in this community don't have something for customers to look at, so they don't know what they're buying. So customers, you know, have a better understanding of what they're getting in their yard before they sign a contract. Um, the whole frontage, we plan on landscaping, uh, putting high-end aluminum in with, uh, if we're allowed, with nice columns, lights, so it's very attractive. Uh, when you go four or five to the space center. Um, one thing about this property, when I first moved over, uh, my wife and I moved over here and started working for another fence company, I pointed out to that property. I said, this is where I want to be in five years. And lo and behold, you know, we're here ahead of time. Um, what I'm going to do to it is, is going to make it beautiful. Um, you know, we, we create a, a, a king out to whatever you say uh, on in backyards. We make, you know, uh, you dream it, we'll build it. A uh, good fence makes a good neighbor. And uh, we plan on making that drive right through there a lot more attractive to, uh, you know, people from out of town and visitors to the complex. Um, you know, we take pride in our community. We do a lot of donations and giving back to the community. And this location will give us what we need to keep giving back to the community and donations and taking care of our customers and keeping everybody happy. Um, uh, well, eventually, you know, we have proposed buildings to build out uh, that's already been approved. We plan on, you know, moving forward with those over the next couple of years, so which will, you know, create revenue for y'all and us and everybody else. Um, plus, we're the only fence company in Titusville. Um, this location, it, you know, is basically keeping us here because we, we've looked everywhere. We have uh, realtors and everybody else looking, and we just can't find anything up in this area that's suitable for us. And we don't want to. My wife and I bought and went over uh, in Titusville, so and we're at four or five, so it's the perfect location for us. Um, and we will make it attractive uh, for many years. It's just been kind of a you know, eyesore, and uh, we're going to make it nice when people drive by because it's such a long, open stretch of road. We're going to make it nice when people drive by, so it's something nice to look at. Um, we will be having uh, materials and stuff. Uh, we plan on consolidating where we store the materials, uh, keep everything nice. There's not going to be um, a bunch of old fence tear out and a bunch of old chain link piled up mountains high. We, we're, we don't, our company don't run that way. You can go buy my shop in Titusville. Um, I got, you know, quite a few trucks that's in and out of there uh, every day, and we keep it clean, organized, and presentable because we like to bring customers to, the, to the, our shop and look around and see our operations so they feel comfortable about doing business with us. So it, it will always be clean. I'm very, very funny about how my, how my stuff is. So it always look nice, and, and it'll be a good, um, it'll be a good representation for Titusville. So. Thank you. <coughs> Are there any questions of Mr. Jacobs? Member Baker. I have just one real quick question. Where is your shop? In Titusville? Um, 7635 US Highway 1, um, River Park Boulevard, and US 1. Uh, I hate to say this, but you know where Pinto's Bar is? Yes. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's, it's just been there forever and day. Everybody knows Pinto's Bar. <laughs> um, it's, you know, where the new logistics, Titusville Logistics Center was built? Big monster facility. We're right across the street. Okay, from there. thank you. I see no other questions. Thank, thank you very much. You. you said you had one card? Yes, Troy for Post. Okay, Mr. Post. Hello, I'm Troy Post. I'm with the uh, North Vivarte Economic Development Zone, and I've uh, spoken to Larry Rhodes, the property owner, several times about this uh, property, and we think that the use that is proposed is a very good use. Um, we're familiar with the business. Uh, I think he will do what he says he's going to do. So in my opinion, we're my economic developers, Cap. Uh, we do support uh, what's being proposed, and we appreciate city staff for working with Mr. Rhodes and trying to put together uh, a proper zoning that would allow uh, there to be the accommodation to permit this use to go forward. So uh, we support it, and I hope it will be approved. Thank you. Thank you. The questions? Are, okay. All right, so we will close this to the public. Um, are there questions of staff? Member Baker. Um, I wanted to know, do you have any comments from any of the single family homes to the east of this property? I did receive uh, a couple calls. I think more or less people were concerned that the zoning change would actually change the zoning on their property, which mm -hmm. isn't the case. Um, and so after I explained that the requested rezoning was only for this specific property um, that we're discussing, uh, I didn't receive any other uh, concerns or comments about that. They mainly just wanted to make sure that the zoning on their single family lots were not, was not going to be affected. Okay, thank you. Um, I had a question about, uh, it's actually a different is Ace Hardware, is that our, is that regional as well? Or is it community commercial where we modified code? Um, I'm not sure I can look Well, the reason why I'm asking that is because um, maybe, maybe it is regional. Um, I just remembered that we had to do something different for, the, for them because they wanted to do outdoor displays. And I thought they were 
Uh, maybe they're regional, but maybe they're. I'm, I'm just confirming, but it looks like they are regional commercial, so okay. they would fall under a similar set of regulations that um, yeah, okay. that we're discussing. I just and the reason why is because if they were community commercial, then it wouldn't have made a difference. Um, right. And then delete it. But okay. Yes, they are. The Ace Hardware is not a regional commercial. Okay. Are there any other questions of staff? Okay. Seeing that, is there a motion on this item? Vice Chairman. Vice Chairman. Mr. Chairman, make a motion to approve the rezoning 1-2018. Uh, Is there a second? Second. Okay, can we take a vote on this? Secretary Chambers? Oh, yes. Vice Chairman Shavir? Yes. Member Baker? Yes. Member Faison? Yes. Chairman Williams? Yes. Motion passes. When does this go before City Council? Uh, sorry, I'm sure you guys already know, but it's just it's for the general public. You have a TV audience, and if you don't, yes. they give you that information. So. This is going, uh, first reading front council will be March uh, 27th, which is next week's meeting, and the public hearing on this will be on April 10th, okay. the following council meeting. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so if we can move to back to the re regular agenda. Yes, going back to item 9B, um, that starts on page tw 22 of your packet. Uh, this is rezoning request number 2-2018 to remove previous conditions of approval applied by Conference Plan Amendment number 2005-02E and subsequently modified by Rezoning 3-2010 uh, for property within the multifamily medium density residential zoning district and within the medium density residential future land use designation. Um, the conditions that are proposed to be removed are they start on page 25, which is page 205 of the staff report. Um, I'm not going to read through all of these, but in general, uh, the conditions that were placed on the property uh, restricted the use to um, a 55 and up uh, multifamily community, including an ALF. It has some um, requirements for conservation buffers, for uh, specific screening requirements, um, and the applicant would like to remove these conditions in order to basically return the property to the, um, the base R2, the multifamily zoning district, uh, which allows for mainly multifamily residential uses, uh, duplexes, triplexes, townhomes, apartments, those sorts of uses. Um, if, I'll be happy to answer any specific questions, but with that, um, I know the applicant is here as well, and they'll answer your questions. Okay, before I open it, I had a question. So I'm trying to understand this, and I was looking at it, because, so before, is Rodney, are you going to come up and speak on this? Okay. Um, so you want to remove the, is it five conditions? Yes, I believe that's and how many there are. The, C, the CUP on this, or it's under the ordinance, that's why. Okay, is ordinance not a CUP on this? It does reference the CUP, however, I believe the CUP was... Um, I, don't, I mean, I don't understand how this would have an ordinance on, on conditions for a piece of property. That is not how we like to practice rezoning. However, there in the past, there were properties that had conditions applied to a rezoning, which is why this probably looks like conditions for a CUP, but it's actually in the ordinance that was used to adopt the R2 zoning on that property. That's all. I mean, I'm just saying that it's not normal. It's not typical, even, correct. Even in the past, it didn't seem... That it would fall under an ordinance, but okay. So, in, essentially, though, if this is going to just R2 multifamily, correct? Uh, no ALF. No, that's not to say that in the, it's the intent of the applicant to develop multifamily res, multifamily apartments. However, but if it did, the R2 zoning district does allow for ALFs if you get a conditional use permit. Okay. So they may have that they have that potential in the future, but they would have to come back for a conditional I just, use. I wanted to frame this so I, when you come up, I understand what, what we're actually dealing with. So. Okay, so we will open this to the public. And Rodney Honeycutt. Mr. Honeycutt. Good evening. Uh, Rodney Honeycutt, 3700 South Washington Avenue in Titusville. And so this rezoning is uh, request is as Trevor explained it. Uh, currently, uh, the project was a subject of a plan for an assisted living facility and a uh, conditional use permit. And um, when the hearing was held, there were conditions that were put on it. And um, so now there's no longer a plan for an assisted living facility to be here. And so um, with 55 and above, it's just be a, a simple multifamily parcel. And so therefore, the request is to remove those conditions. So it's just simple R2 zoning as originally, as, as um, the zoning implies, except it has all those conditions on it. Okay. Are there questions of Mr. Honeycutt? Okay. I see none. Okay. I got a question. Yes, sir. A while back. You're good. I'm sorry. <laughs> a while back, there was a request to put a system living down on River Road, River Drive, on the Bay River. Okay. I was just wondering if it was the same people. Um, I'm guessing that it's not. Um, probably in the last, just FYI, probably in the last 10 or 15 years, um, I've been involved in maybe plans for three or four assisted living projects, and we rezone it, and they never come to fruition. Mm -hmm. uh, we were involved in one, the Benton House, that's now changed, that actually did come. In. But I think the problem is that when you get financing for an assisted living, you have to have so much down, like 30 or 40%, that it keeps a lot of these projects from going through. 
because there was another one north of here, uh, this site, that didn't go through. Then there's this one also. I know there have been a couple more, like one out on 405 not too long ago. Yeah. So the financing is just so difficult on these projects that unless it's someone that's experienced in you know, doing this up front, it, they don't seem to go through. And so the client that owns it now has no plans at all for an assisted living. They just want a single, uh, simple multifamily and project. The so. other one was down along the river, close to the river, on the river road. And we said there was no way of getting out of there in case of the emergency. There was one way out. And if it got blocked, they was trapped. Mm -hmm. I just wondered if this was the same. I don't, I don't think so. Okay. But this is Condev, right? The Condev owns the property now. And the the previous ones, people that owned it, right. Condev was not involved. Right, and that's what, and Condev is mainly non pavilion owns here. Single family, yes. Uh, which I think they, over the police department, is that, was that their development? Um, yes, uh, north of the police department. Yeah. They did most of all of that. Yes, Meadow, Meadow yeah, Ben Oak. Yeah. And, yeah. Okay. Are there any other questions? Vice Chairman, Shabir. Uh, is this going to be uh, private residences or is this going to be a rental development? Do you know? Currently, their plans are to have a rental. A rental apartment, and if I had to say it was similar, it would be the new one on Knox McRae across from the uh, school. And, and so it was strictly rental as opposed to multi use? Yes, that's currently what's going okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, hold on, I've got one question. I mean, I'm surprised that you, you didn't request maybe R3 or just R2 works, and that's. Yeah, they're satisfied with that. Okay. All right, thank you. Any other cards? No, sir. Okay, so we'll close this item to the public. Um, yeah, I just, originally when I, I didn't understand this because it had a CUP that would have been expired by now and so the conditions would have went away but under ordinance. So do, do you have to do anything to the ordin ordinance to say oh, this ordinance has been... Basically, the ordinance will be adopted if, if this is ultimately approved would just remove those conditions that were previously applied by um, the, the previous ordinances. So it would remove the ordinances that were originally applied by ordinance number 102-2005 and then subsequently modified. Um, and I'm just saying, is there anything else you need to do, like a, a, some other action to say we're going to modify the ordinance since this is a rezoning, not a ordinance change? Because it was the original was applied, the original conditions were applied via a conference amendment with an associated rezoning. The conditions were then modified by a rezoning, so we're following that same process. So that if in the future someone wanted to track back on that property and do that, they could pick it up through the rezoning actions. It is still modifying the ordinance. Um, it's basically just modifying the ordinance to remove all those conditions that were that were placed on there. Okay. All right. So we close this item to the public. Is there any more questions or comment from the board? Okay. Seeing none, is there a motion on this item? I move that we approve <coughs> 6 2017 to amend the uh, ordinance, to amend the zoning map. Okay. We have motion. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Good second. So can we take a roll call on this or the vote? Vice Chairman Shavir? Yes. Member Baker? Yes. Member Faison? Yes. Secretary Chambers? Yes. Chairman Williams? Yes. And when does this come before City Council? This will go before Council um, March 27th, which is next week, for first reading, and then April 10th for the public hearing. Okay. Thank you. Next item, please. Uh, item 9C, the Shoreline Protection Ordinance, uh, begins on page 38 of your packet. During the land development code reformatting, the city council directed staff to replace the area impact plan requirement, which previously applied to all new construction or the expansion of existing uses within the shoreline mixed use zoning district. The proposed ordinance includes regulations to protect the shoreline, water quality and biodiversity of the lakes, rivers, and portions of the Indian River Lagoon within the city juris jurisdiction. At the October 10, 2017 city council meeting, council held a public hearing and a second reading of the ordinance. Ultimately, council took no action and requested that a, work that a workshop be conducted to discuss this item. Uh, the Shoreline Protection Ordinance Workshop was held on December 5th and was attended by several members of the public. During the public comment period, several residents mentioned their concern about the requirements relating to the repair and replacement of bulkheads or seawalls. Uh, previously, section 30-64 E2A and uh, E2B. The City Council directed staff to omit these provisions based on the feedback received at the workshop, which basically means that um, as the ordinance was originally written, if a seawall was destroyed beyond a certain percentage, it could not be replaced. Uh, since the hurricane came through shortly after this, um, or since the ordinance was heard shortly after Hurricane Irma, which destroyed many of the seawalls in town, the, uh, the council was of the opinion and directed staff to remove those con provisions in the code to allow people to repair their seawall, um, regardless of the percentage of damage that occurred to it. Uh, property owners along the Indian River have been notified in writing of the dates of the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting, which is today, March 21st, and of the public hearing uh, before City Council on March 27th, which is next week's uh, uh, City Council meeting. Uh, the proposed ordinance includes a change to section 3064 uh, b1b page 8 of 18 which i believe Lori just handed out to you um, the ordinance that we uploaded in the packet was uh, an older version and the highlighted language that you see there is what was uh, placed in the in the ordinance um, 
In addition, amendments to Section 30-69 state that submerged lands may not be used to calculate density, uh, language which clarifies the city's longstanding policy and was previously contained within Section 59-948 of the Land Development Regulations. Uh, and with that, I will try and answer any questions that you have. Okay. We'll open this to the public. Are there any cards on this item? No, sir. Okay. Ma'am, did you uh, want to speak on this item at all? Okay. All right, so we'll close this to the public. Are there questions of staff? Vice Chairman Shavir. Uh, page 38, your last paragraph. Uh, can you, uh, in addition, you can have a third line addition. In addition, amendments to section, amendments to section 30 there, 69 states that the submerged lands may not be used to calculate density. Can you explain that, please? Yes, um, the, I, I think the most notable example of when that occurred was the development of the Harbor Point condos here in downtown. In some areas, um, the property owners along the waterfront they actually own part of the submerged lands in the, in the lagoon. Um, it has long been, as it's referenced here, it's been a long-standing policy of the city to not allow those lands to be used to calculate density. So let's say that you own one acre of land that's, you know, actual dry land on shore, but you own another four acres of bottom lands. You cannot use those four acres that are under the water to you to be counted towards your maximum density on your property. You would only be able to use that one acre of upland property that you have in order to calculate any density in terms of residential uses. And so that's what that, that basically is stating. So what about um, like Kennedy Point? Is it Kennedy Point? They have a, um, although it's separate now, I believe, the marina there, Correct. Um, which is submerged lands. But do they, if that was the case, which they're selling those as lots, or they, they could have, they were selling them as, this. Like the condo units you're talking about? Yeah. Okay. They have condo units, then they have the, um, the boat slips, and they're uh -huh. only boat slips. Um, are the marina slots used for any density calculations? No, sir. And is that because of the submerged lands, or is that because No, that's just because we don't, although people do live aboard their boats sometimes, uh, marinas really are just a commercial venture. Most of the time, people just store their boats there, so they're not considered um, residential units. I'm just asking if that, that was consideration. I know in the past, uh, I think it was discussed. Yes, the city has a submerged lands lease with the state of Florida the Department of Environmental Protection, which states that we can't have liveaboards and we can't have occupants of the marina using our, our marina as their primary residence, if that answers your question. <laughs> but you do. Okay. We Maybe. don't have liveaboards year round. You can have liveaboards for a certain portion of the year, but it has to be less than six months. Okay. What about the uh, mooring stations? Is that Those can't be used as residences. Those either. Okay. I'm not trying to find some loophole. I'm just. Just asking. Uh, the question I had was, would this impact the Kotsky property that they are actually using density, the submerged density calculations, which was grandfathered in? So because that was part of the development agreement with, yes. with the city, this and this regulation is now happening subsequent to that um, development agreement. If they choose to build under that development agreement, they would be able to build within the parameters of that. However, any let's say that development agreement expires, any new development would have to um, meet the requirements of the code unless some other kind of agreement was, was reached with, with the city council on that, on the density issue. So one of the questions I also had was about, there's a lot of talk about bulkheads, um, but maybe I missed it, but is bulkheads considered seawalls as well? Although they are different, but I'm not, I wouldn't see seawall language in here. I think in general, I think the ordinance references bulkheads primarily, but I, I believe in here they're more or less used interchangeably. Okay, so I would suggest a reference, uh, put a definition that it includes. Okay. I, I have a seawall, uh -huh. um, that's why I was actually up in arms over this, because I didn't realize that we would have been able to replace. Mm -hmm. And so we were actually going to have to replace ours. Mm -hmm. And um, so now I, I think we've got a, a good fix, but that was still, we were rushing sure. this uh, in fear that there was going to be major changes. And then my fear was, look, I could still own that place in 20 years. Um, we were, we're not conducive, uh, our property is not conducive to making that change. Sure. Uh, and so I'm glad that that was removed because that, that was a, actually that was supposed to be a deal breaker for me because, um, although I guess it is a financial thing, so I probably would have to, I don't know if I'd have to abstain, but um, and let's see. Uh, I'll go ahead and, Vice Chairman Shavir. I, I want to understand this now. So typically right now, if you have a, a, a bulkhead seawall, okay, and it's destroyed or damaged in some way, you do not have to repair it or replace it. You can use some other a bulkhead type uh, repair to the seawall. Basically right now, the, the city's land development regulations are silent on these sorts of issues. Um, if someone wanted to install a new bulkhead and or um, replace a damaged seawall or bulkhead, they would be able to, so long as they get the appropriate permits from DEP and, and Army Corps and the other state and federal permitting agencies they have to. But nothing the city has on, on file would prohibit that. What this is saying is that we are establishing alternative options um, and we are prohibiting new seawalls from being established. But if someone already has a seawall or a bulkhead and it is damaged during a storm or other event, they, they will be able to replace that if they so choose. What other uh, types of protection would you have if you did not have a seawall? 
So other options discussed in here, uh, in, I believe, include uh, riprap or a living shoreline type facility, uh, basically something that's more natural to help, you know, improve the water quality and the, the, um, the health of the lagoon. So theoretically, instead of having a seawall, you could bring in materials like rocks, large rocks, okay, Potentially. To, to protect your shoreline. Correct, yeah, the goal, the goal here is to um, allow people to protect their property, um, but at the same time also, if we can improve the, the water quality of the lagoon. So that's why there are basically alternative options established in their like living shoreline that accomplish the goal of protecting the shoreline and, people, and you know, some of the private property and uh, increasing the health of the, of the lagoon. If for some reason or other we had a major storm, okay, and you had large amounts of washout, okay, uh, for some of those properties on the river, what would be the cure uh, for that? What, what would happen if the property, say you lost 20 feet of your frontage, okay, because of the, the wave action or whatever, right. what would be the resulting, what would be the, the remedy to fix that? It's, it's my understanding through here that um, they, so long as you could get it permitted through, like I said, the other state and federal agencies, you could basically reestablish the former your former shoreline, and then if you had a seawall or whatever, if you had a seawall, you could potentially re repair or replace it if you would like, or you could use another alternative method that we have established in our regulations here to, to protect anything like that from happening in the future. Member Jason. Being a new member, um, I don't understand the history behind this. So what was the rationale behind passing the, the original um, proposal? So um, a couple years ago, the the planning staff took on reorganizing our land development regulations, which you know basically control um, how development occurs in the city. One of the things through that process that we took care of was a process that we eliminated from the code was a process that we felt was cumbersome and not all that advantageous to the city and or property owners, and that was called the um, Area Impact Plan, and AIP. Um, through that, the, the Planning and Zoning Commission and the City Council both felt that we needed something, um, but maybe the, the AIP was not the best option, so they um, directed staff to move forward with coming up with an ordinance to help uh, protect the shoreline and also to, uh, within our means, improve the, the water quality of the inner lagoon. And so that's the impetus as to why this ordinance was drafted. And then it was presented last fall, and then after um, comments from the public, City Council basically tabled the item so that they could have a workshop with those persons that were concerned. And then after that, they directed us to, to modify the ordinance slightly, and that, that revised version is basically what is before you this evening. Thank you. Vice Chairman Schreer. I'm just curious, on, I'm just going back a little bit my thought process. A riparian rights, um, when you have, uh, say, a, a, a seawall that collapses, or you, how, how does that, how does, the, how do the riparian rights work uh, in, in, in connection with this restoration of your shoreline? As far as it does, does the proposed ordinance limit those riparian rights at all? Well, if you, how, how far out do you go from the property, from the landline, out into the water? How far are the riparian rights? How, how much of that, does that exist? I mean, I don't know that. I'm, I'm just assuming that a certain amount of that water frontage beyond your seawall is riparian rights. I think that, that I think that varies typically on if you unless you own the bottomlands. Um, I believe that you, the, basically the repair, the water line or whatever, I forget the term, it's, it's not mean high water line anymore. The state has changed how they refer to that. But basically, that mean high water line is, is the extent of your property. Um, you may be able to encroach out into the water further so long as you get the appropriate permits, but I don't know that you're entitled to a specific distance from that mean high water line, unless you do own those bottom lands. And then in that case, it, it varies from property to property. Yeah, they, they, I remember a few years back, there was some controversy or some, something worked out uh, with that repair. Right. Anyway, thank you. So I wanted to have some questions about class two and class three, and I was going through it. and. So one of the major changes was under class two, you, uh, you're saying you want to increase that pro to 50 feet. So then I look at class two and I see that in class two is distinguished by um, shellfish uh, propagation and harvesting, basically clamming, or right? Where you can put up the clam uh, cages. That I'm not sure, I'm not sure. Is that what, is that what class two means? I'm not sure the, um, okay, so class two shellfish propagation. Page 16. I, yeah, I'm assuming that, uh, what that would mean is, yeah, anywhere that the waters are suitable for that sort of harvesting of basically of fish. What I'm looking at is only a small portion, which I'm not complaining, mm -hmm. please don't take it that way. Only a small portion of Pattysville is actually classified as class three, which is essentially, I mean, I think that whole entire area is already developed with a, uh, that's R RMU zonings and. The, yeah, the shoreline mixed use. And, correct. Um, so those are, that's already pretty much already taken up or the 50 feet is going to be no matter what, right? That's my understanding. Okay, so and then you go down to JJ Road, and then it starts to class three there. So for the most part, it, the 50 feet will not impact Titusville, according to the map. Yeah, and that map is not. I mean, that's not something that I, I bring that up because 50 feet is a. I mean, we have properties that are in 50 feet. That's uh, true. Uh, you know, in depth, uh, right there on the river that they wouldn't have been able to de develop. And I, and so you know, I'm just saying that. I, at first, I thought it was a very uh, kind of over regulation because. Uh, but at second glance, when you start looking at the maps. Um, 25 feet has been the standard, and it's actually it's a standard now, I believe, correct? Uh, yes, I do believe and that's, that's so the case within the Titusville shoreline area um, overlay. Um, the, let's see, the shoreline mixed use, I, 
wait, what's it say here? The 25 feet currently applies to vacant lots within the the shoreline area overlay. Let's see, only lots not regulated by the shoreline overlay, and then I believe that is the case. Yes. So I just wanted to understand that because that's that, that's uh, at first glance it looks like a major change. At second glance, it looks um, it looks doesn't look as uh, bad. Yeah, and to go on that, we weren't trying to establish very very large setbacks to base to preclude development. We were more concerned about um, the condition of the shoreline itself, and then what is. Um, what is placed within that either 25 or 50 feet in terms of impervious surface to help regulate the runoff that goes into the lagoon so that right. you, know, you, you can control some of the impervious surfaces and things like that that really create a lot of runoff into uh, that water body. So I'm glad you bring up runoff because um, I wanted to get into that and that had to deal with the um, bulkheads. Um, so my, it's not like I'm an engineer or anything, but um, so I'm just going to apply some common sense here. Um, I've had, I think I've been doing this long enough to, to know stormwater, but um, know some. And so I'm looking at the slope, and it gives you the specifications of the slope of the river. And I'm saying, look, we want to go to a more natural feel, and so you can put rock, which it isn't that, cooking in that is not natural to the river. But you're putting a slope there. And on top of that, um, the way I'm perceiving it, if the intent is to uh, keep pollutants away from the river, the bulkhead is, is more reactive to that. Um, because you have a slope up, and the water is not going to go over. And so the other uh, part of this ordinance is requesting that all stormwater is contained there on the property. And so I'm thinking to myself, how can that be when you're using a natural shoreline or whether you're putting rocks there, when then you're letting uh, runoff into the river when it's actually a bulkhead with a pitch would keep it contained? And so I'm just I'm bringing this up. It's, I'm not trying to persuade anybody on this, but I'm just saying, look, let's put a little common sense in this. I know uh, looks um, are one thing. Aesthetics, you know, are one thing. but if the intent is for a clean river, um, that's something that needs to be discussed. Okay. Fair one, one comment that I will add, I'm not sure if it's already been stated, but the reason that the city incorporated class two and three waters into the ordinance is because the Brevard County ordinance follows that model. And we looked to the Brevard County Natural Resources Department for some guidance before we drafted this. Okay. And that's the setbacks and the standard that they apply throughout the county. And so to be consistent with the rest of the county, that was what we used. Okay. Thank you. So yeah, I'm just looking at um, intent. Um, and obviously there was some discussion about um, um, gosh, it's, um, it's, it's actually a major problem here in Titusville about why river so bad. Um, tanks, uh, septic tanks. tanks. But unfortunately, we don't have that issue, but we still have a milky chocolate milk river because, I mean, I, I know that sounds nasty, but my point is, is that obviously we're not dealing with septic tanks like other areas. Um, but um, I do think that we need to uh, be more aggressive on keeping pollutants out of the river. But at, at the same time, we have to look at not, not having main breaks, main breaks into the river um, and um, doing everything to protect it. So I'm off the box and I'll go to Vice Chairman Shavir. Uh, if we had a uh, storm that devastated the shoreline, if we had a storm that devastated the shoreline, uh, who is responsible for repairing it? The it, homeowners, the homeowner, the property owner? It's the, the property owner, correct. Yep. And they may be able to get some reimbursement potentially through FEMA or homeowners insurance or something like that, but it, it is the responsibility of, of the property owner. If they want to repair it, it's, it's their burden to do so. So I think we had this discussion before we brought this up. And I, I'm, I mean, I'm, I understand those are all private properties along there, but uh, in a catastrophic situation where you have tremendous erosion, uh, the city, county has no uh, obligation to restore the, the, the shoreline? It, it's my understanding that unless it is um, going to impact and or damage a public facility, uh, that the city or county is not liable to repair those private properties. Um, after the after Irma, one of the, some of the shore eroded and one of is either a, a sanitary sewer pipe or stormwater pipe was basically partially sticking out of the ground. The city did cover that, but there again, that's because it was potentially going to harm a public utility and something that's owned by the public, but not, not private property. Uh, Go back to the fact that uh, when you have a shoreline, and you have an established shoreline, and you know where your property line is, and you know where the water line is, okay? When you have deg degradation to that coastal line, okay, whose responsibility is it to repair it? In other words, it, it's not all yours. It's not, it doesn't all belong to the property owner. The, 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 there, there's some shoreline there that belongs to the city or the state or whatever it may happen to be. So I, I, I'm, I'm just... Uh, up to the point of that, and I'm, again, I think this is the wrong term, but that mean high water line, that point that's established, that if the property owner owns up to that boundary, it's their responsibility to take care of, if they so choose to repair any, any of those damages to, and either do it, you know, backfill and, and stabilize that shoreline, that's, that's the property owner's responsibility. Thank you. 
I had another question, and it had to deal with um, uh, plants. And uh, we're, I remember there was discussion in here about going back to natural vegetation, and and um, and so I was trying to understand the. It's I think it's a, it's preferred to do this, is, or what is the actual intent of the ordinance for when it comes to plantings and. Do you happen to recall which section I was in? Um, let's see. So it might have been in stabilization, but I'm on page 48, but. Page 48. 47, 48, but <clears throat> I thought I was reading about plantings and then, then so many feet. Maybe I'm reading it in, in the other part that you sent us. It's not, maybe it's the second part. Are you talking about the um, 3064B1B at the very bottom of page 40, or the bottom of page 47, lines 22 through 25? Let me look. I just want to get an understanding of the intent on that. So let's see. Yeah, I think, yeah, that's it. That's where I was talking about. Okay, for activities, protection setback. Yeah, okay, that's exactly what I was talking about. Thank you. Okay. And, and it's talking about under the setback there, and mm -hmm. that this is what you're requesting to be planted. We're talking about a densely planted shoreline? Yes. Oh, okay. I don't see anything there. 10 feet in width is what it's requesting for. 10 feet in width the entire length of the shoreline, right. And so that's basically, that would be, that's talking about any alterations that are allowed. It's, um, I think it's dealing mainly with uh, stormwater, more or less. That's what the first part is dealing with. And then the second part, I think, is dealing with that stabilization of, um, of the shoreline, kind of how they work in connection with each other. Right. Um, so it's under B, B, 1, A. And B, Hold yeah. Hold on. I'm just, because you have to look at the structure of this. So you go from, say, 46, it stops at 5. Yeah, so the new section starts there right at the top of page 47. Okay. So A, B. All right. So what it's telling me, what I'm thinking I'm reading here, and tell me if I'm wrong, is that that's a requirement. Correct. And what that is doing is it's using a, um, it's using basically a, a stormwater management system and then that natural vegetation um, to help treat that stormwater before it, basically before it goes back into the lagoon. So, so in those situations. requesting a burn there, burn or swale, uh -huh. but prior to the water edge, as, now is that in the setback? Or is that outside setback, and then you have the setback? No, that, I, that could be within that required setback. So I'm just saying, I'm trying to, you have a burn at the river's edge. Potentially. It depends on how the stormwater system is designed. Each property will likely be different because not every property follows the exact same contour as it nears the water. And so it could, it could be a swale where it's just a, you know, an mm -hmm. indentation, or it could be a berm that helps stop the stormwater running down before it hits the lagoon itself to help slow that and let it as much absorb as possible. So it's really going to be site specific and that's why uh, it requires basically yeah, a professional any, engineer. Any development, well I guess you know, in reality any development that you have is going to, um, it's like the river isn't even there. What do you mean by that? Because your stormwater has to be contained on your property. Correct, you can't have a legal positive outfall but in, essentially yes, I mean you have to maintain your stormwater on site. So this would, um, that doesn't necessarily apply to if someone's just further improving an existing property. Um, but yes, any new development would fall under the, the current today standards for stormwater management. But uh, what I was kind of questioning was the native vegetation at the river's edge. Because if your outfall, or not your outfall, your stormwater is captured within the land, then this is kind of like an extra, okay, we want you to do 10 foot planting, which is a uh, expensive change to anybody that's developing on the river. It, I mean, it could have financial impacts, yes. I think that one of the points of this particular subsection is to clarify that a five foot access is allowable with that alteration within that dense vegetation. So you're saying, so it's kind of giving included because you, because you want the to access and the vegetation. Access. Exactly. I mean, I don't, I don't know. It just seems, it seems, I'm all for protecting the river. I just, I just also believe that I don't want to burden somebody's redevelopment either when you're achieving the same thing with the burn, berm or swale. And I'm sure any developers that are, but then again, like I said, most, most everything is pretty much developed on the river. A lot of it, yeah. Um, so in, in essence, it isn't going to really affect hardly any properties because everything's been developed or the, the large scale lands have been um, pre-done, pre-decided. Okay. All right, I will, uh, that's, that's my final question for now. No. For now, I'm good. I, I'm, are there any other questions from anybody else? This is a rather quick meeting, isn't it? I was expecting water. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so with that, is there a motion on this item? Uh, I can do it this 
I will say I appreciate the changes, and I think you guys did a really good job. But Ed, Mr. Glendo, is he the one that was in charge of? Uh, yes, Eddie, our natural resources planner, was responsible for researching and drafting the, the vast majority of this. So um, I know he's put a lot of work into it. Vice Chairman Shapiro. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion to approve ordinance number 18-2018, Shoreline Protection Ordinance. Okay, do we have a second? Okay, we have a motion and a second. Can we take roll call on this vote? Vice Chairman Shavir? Yes. Member Baker? Yes. Secretary Chambers? Yes. Member Faison? Yes. Chairman Williams? Yes. All right. That was the last item? So yes. We will go to reports. Uh, the only thing I just want to remind everyone, I think you saw Lori's email earlier this week, or I hope so. We're, as I said before, we're transitioning away from paper, so next next time you will get a link to the agenda, as you already have been, um, but there will be no large paper copy coming. As I said before, if you'd like us to mail you the agenda cover sheets so that you can make notes and, and write questions on there, we'll be more than happy to do so. Um, we can just send those out via regular mail and you'll get them a couple days after um, the agenda, but that's up to you all. And we can mail it out only to those that want it and feel free. If you would like them, either contact Lori or I and we can coordinate that you that you get those cover sheets. Another than that, I don't have anything. All right, thank you. Now, but we'll still continue to get updates on city council's decisions and... Actually, yes, I apologize, I had not done that recently, but we can still certainly uh, send you those updates as well, summary of action from council. Absolutely. Thank you. City Attorney. Okay, so we'll take petitions from request, petitions and requests from public, public present. Is anything you'd like to come up? No? All right, so let's go down the list. Member Hare, anything from the school board? Nothing uh, this week. Uh, Mr. Lindman did not get in touch with me. I have a feeling he's gone. It's right before spring break. Uh, okay. Board, Mr. Payson, this is just an opportunity if uh, there's something you want to bring up or want to report or anything you want to mention. Nothing? Okay. Vice Chairman Shavir. I have a question. Uh, can you uh, update on council's action toward uh, shipping containers? <laughs> for shipping containers, do you have to recall? What? As residences? Yes. Do you have the shipping container uh, ordinance? I do. I remember what you're talking about. Um, I'm not sure what council act, council's final action was, but I will, like, since uh, Chairman Williams reminded me, I will be happy to take the last couple of summaries of actions and I can send them to you all tomorrow morning. Okay. I just don't remember off the top of my head. Thank you. Secretary Chambers? Uh, nothing. Okay. Member Baker? Okay. I only have one thing, um, and I ask this because this is going on in Osceola, Osceola County right now. So we've made a shift in how we handle. Um, we've come in and we've put, like, uh, like, restrictions on deeds and stuff, recorded on deeds and stuff like that. Um, here in Titusville where we said, look, record it on the deed that way, the information is continued on and, and it's in one spot. When you guys see something, correct, do you remember some of this? No, I'm not. I've seen it um, in, in the past where there's recordings and... Like deed restrictions and those sorts of things? Deed restrictions. Okay, and yes, those, I mean, those are required for any subdivision or any, any yes. plat, anything like that, yeah. All right. So my question is, and this is what's... Uh, somebody that, that I know, um, and so I, I want to understand this because we were doing some of this here, so we would record it so... There wasn't the question of changing of city staffs, changing the boards, um, and so there was. Uh, we were changing to some of that. I don't know if we, I don't haven't seen anything like that for a while. But the point is, is what Osceola County supposedly said was that it's not their job to enforce those restrictions. And so I'm just saying, when we make these changes, let's in, in this particular situation, somebody, uh, the restriction was it was a restricted community where you couldn't have mobile homes, and so if we were to have that here, and my question to them was. Well, how would they get uh, an occupancy permit? So in, in the case of uh, if someone tried to locate a mobile home, let's say in a, in a typical single-family neighborhood, our zoning code does not allow that. So no, and by that, but if it was a, if it was a manufactured home. So we, we get that question not a lot, but we do get it off, uh, every now and then. People have questions if they can install a manufactured home in, let's say, like an R1B zoning district. Our, our, we've sat down and talked about it, and basically our response to, to anyone that asks that is if it is manufactured to meet the Florida Building Code specifications, just like any other single-family home would be, um, those would be allowed, meaning that they might come, they might ship panels to, to a property and they can assemble them on site. If they are assembled and they meet all the requirements of the Florida Building Code, those would be allowed. However, a mobile home is actually um, licensed basically by the Department of Transportation, the DOT. Those would not be allowed in a single-family zoning district. But if it was deed restricted, um, uh, I thought that... Deed restrictions can be more stringent than but, our city regulations. But I, I, yes, I know. Right. Um, definitely, I know this. So, but um, <laughs> um, well, the reason why I'm asking this is that I would think that the city, I only ask, I'm asking because I want to understand our situation if, if it was to happen here. Sure. I would think that the city would say, sorry, we can't give you uh, an occupancy permit um, because it's restricted. But what I'm being told there is they're saying, for the other homeowners there, they're saying it's, it's not the county's responsibility and that they need to go hire a, a lawyer to go fight it when the government is actually setting this up to say, hey, you know, this is how we want to take this information. 
No, I actually I think that that is what would happen here. We do not the city we as a city do not enforce deed restrictions. Um, so whenever you see play, you know, neighborhoods that have requirements that are above and beyond the city in terms yes. of colors or fencing materials or that sort of thing, that we don't enforce those deed restrictions because that is a self-imposed restriction just yeah, for yes, the yes. property owners. And I understand that, but yeah. I'm saying that if you were to put a modular home on an R1B that is deed restricted, yeah, the city if they applied for a building permit. Yes. To install mobile home where they were not allowed, yeah, one, the building permit should be denied, and they certainly wouldn't be able to get a certificate of occupancy because the use is not allowed in that zoning district. So in that case, I'm just saying that's how it would be that. treated. But now, and here's the, um, here's the one. If you were to put, this is the situation. Mm -hmm. They put a, um, actually, I feel like I'm giving out all the gossip and details. I'm really not. <laughs> I just want to make sure how we would handle it here within this city because it would be a problem for some areas. Um, I would think it was it would be the city's responsibility to stop it, even though I wouldn't expect you to go into a um, uh, a gated community and obviously uh, enforce their rules, but at the same time, if you were to, so I'll back up and, so if they were to put a, um, guess what they call it, it's the concrete wall and it's a crawl space, um, and then they put the, the modular home on there, is that an exception to, would I, that be an exception here? No, because it's not, it's not based on how the, the mobile home or the modular home is affixed to the ground, it's whether or not, it's the standards to which the entire structure is, mm -hmm. is built. And so it wouldn't matter if they just, but the typical, you know, like on mobile home, the typical just metal skirt around it, or they put it on um, concrete blocks, unless it meets the Florida building code. But it would. I mean, obviously, they, it's, it's the same. I would look at it as like what we look as um, um, sheds. If you've got a stamp on there, then they don't apply. The city codes don't apply because the state has already permitted it. If I went down to Lowe's, sheds are a little different because that's not a that's, technically like a habitable structure. That's Florida standards that are being applied, and the mobile home, would, not a mobile, modular home, would be uh, bought off too by not necessarily by, by state codes. It. The is modular that, homes that are they're brought in on wheels and then set on tied down or set on some kind of foundation, those do not meet the Florida building code. They are okay. they meet a set of DOT standards, but okay. they don't meet Florida building code. Oh, good. So, yeah, there, there is a differentiation there. Okay. All right. So I'll, uh, I'm good. I feel educated now. Vice Chairman Shavir. I have a couple of questions about uh, ongoing things around the city. Uh, I'd like maybe you can give us some information on the status of Royal Oak. And also the, uh, I think it was it, uh, the restaurant here, the balls came down. Yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, Across from Titusville High School? Yeah. <clears throat> and then also Imperial Estates, how's that coming? What was the issue in Imperial Estates? Well, do you remember the, the, some of the apartments were ruined, water damage? Oh, I wasn't aware of that. Are you talking about Bay Towers? Uh -huh. Oh. Bay Towers, I'm sorry. Bay Towers. We, don't, we don't know Imperial Estates as that property, yeah. so. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'd like to um, answer your questions if you have any specific questions on the last two of those three. Um, with Bay Towers, we have a settlement agreement that is near the final stages of completion to close out the code enforcement matter that started in 2008. If that's what you're asking about, um, we're waiting on payment from the owner for the amount that was negotiated to accept that code enforcement lien is being satisfied. The work has been performed to the city's satisfaction to close out the old case. It's in compliance from 2008. There's other issues that are going on on the property unrelated to the 2008 matter. Um, as soon as that release is provided, then I will update the board. I'm hoping that will happen in the next month or so. With the old Taco Bell property, those walls did come down pursuant to a demolition permit that was applied for. and. I don't know that the permit was closed out or not, but the services have been removed from that site. Is, is there any particular question that you have about that property? Well, is it, what's the plan for it? Let's put it that way. There was previously a building permit that was applied for and that did not have any substantial action after six months and that permit expired. So the demolition permit was the most recent activity that I was aware of. Um, I don't know of any site development going on at that site. Um, with regard to Royal Oak, what's your specific question? What's the status of that whole project in terms of the ownership and uh, I'll have to report back to you. You want to know who is the owner or well, you remember it, I, it was I think in it was foreclosure. A, a yeah, Canadian was. company, uh, if I'm not mistaken, some Canadian bank uh, repossessed that property of my understanding. And I want to know if anything else has gone on since then. I mean, has anyone made a move to develop the property, purchase the property, or enhance the property, or do something with it? There's been no action regarding development of this site, but the only thing I could report back is whether or not there's been any change in ownership. Right. So I want to take on that one real quick. On the um, Golf course, do you remember the ordinance over golf course redevelopment? What was this, did that, go, what was this, what happened with that? Uh, basically, uh, if I recall correctly, this commission seemed to be agreeable to what we were proposing. Um, city Council uh, ultimately did not approve it, I think, at the, more or less at the will of the property owners around Royal Oak. Um, so we still have it. We didn't, I mean, it's not being acted on and it was not officially adopted. If it comes up in the future that, you know, someone would like us to readdress that, we can certainly bring it back for consideration. But at this point, we're not taking any further action on it. Okay. Vice Chairman? I, read, I didn't read the whole article in the paper, maybe you did, but the county's backing out of golf courses. <laughs> they, they, uh, that's, they have been for some time, yeah. Yeah, and it was in the paper that, that they've decided just to get out of the business and only in these properties so, and maintaining them, so I don't know what the future holds for that. Uh, I was just wondering, it, you know, looking at all golf courses, if we're going to. That is certainly the trend. Um, more and more you see 
you know, golf courses um, ceasing operations and many times are sold to uh, to someone that ultimately ends up developing at least a portion of them. That was, uh, whenever we were working on our ordinance, that was very common in South Florida. Uh, and it was, as time has went on, that's occurring not just in Florida, but all over the country. And um, more and more you hear about those sorts of, of things happening. Okay. All right, so we're adjourned. Thank you.